have a, a very interesting uh, uh, monthly forum. It's the, the first uh, monthly forum of, of uh, uh, the year. And we change a little bit the format. Normally it's one and a half hour, but uh, for this kind of very interesting topic, and we have, uh, as you can see, and I will present them in a minute, so we have a, a lot of, of speakers. We decide to expand a, a little bit uh, until two. We are not obliged to go until two. Uh, if we finish uh, earlier, it's okay, but uh, at least we have more uh, uh, more time for discussion and for reflection. And uh, the title of the, the monthly forum and topic of the monthly forum is about the, the first uh, successful uh, citizen I initiative uh, and the analysis of, of that kind of success. And uh, I think that what is interesting uh, with the initiative that you have, kind of have and we will have that, that uh, two reading of it. One is the reading uh, which is the making of the alliance, the result, the, the link with the European Parliament, the Commission, uh, etc. And the second one is a, a little bit broader because uh, as we know, uh, there is no so many tools uh, uh, for the, the trade unions uh, at European level. The strike is difficult, uh, mobilization and demonstration are costly. Uh, influence uh, like the NGO is not completely in the culture so it was kind of new tool uh, for the trade unions and others and, and we, we can also have broader vision is this tool could be uh, useful to help to change or at least partly change the, the global narrative at European level so I have kind of very broad vision about uh, initiative we, we analyze the, the initiative per se it's interesting uh, but we can also uh, see a broader question from, from there. For doing that, we, we have uh, as uh, key speaker Andreas Bieler, who is uh, nearly finished uh, finishing uh, a paper that I have uh, here, long paper uh, with a lot of interview uh, and a, a, a lot of, of really interesting remarks. We will uh, introduce for 20, <coughs> 25 minutes the, the topic is vision and then we will have comments from a different perspective. Uh, the first one in the other, and we'll see if uh, will be, uh, perhaps we will follow the, the order, uh, will be uh, Lynn Boylan from uh, Ireland. Uh, and uh, she was rather involved in the European Parliament. So I suppose that you will give your opinion from your political perspective, but also from the, 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 the role of the European Parliament. Uh, then we have uh, kind of perhaps the part of the master, or the, the chief of the initiative, or part of the uh, initiator at least, uh, Jan Willem Gudrian, General Secretary uh, from EPSU, who will uh, continue uh, the, the comments and also uh, certainly uh, give us some uh, information about uh, what was the, the strategy and how he, he can uh, assess uh, the result of that strategy from a, a trade union point of view. And finally, we, we, we have uh, Louisa Parks, uh, who will continue the, the, the discussion uh, about the, the link between this initiative and social movement. She has present, I don't know if it's already published, also a very interesting uh, paper framing the Right to Water European Citizen uh, Initiative. Uh, you can find at least the draft on uh, internet and Googling uh, its name and water and paper and you have the second is uh, her paper. So uh, for those, if it's not yet published, you can have this uh, uh, presentation she, she gave in September. So. Uh, Thank you all for coming, and Andreas, you have the, the floor, and I give you the, the mic, too. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Philippe. Thank you very much for inviting me here to, to give this presentation today on Mobilizing for Change, the first successful European citizens' initiative, Water is a Human Right. Now, clearly, the core of this presentation is about the successful European citizens' initiative. And I think it's successful, of course, because it did succeed at collecting almost 1.9 million signatures between the May 2012 and November 2013. And it was based on a broad trade union social movement and uh, uh, NGO alliance. 
But I think it has also been so successful because it uh, came at a moment, it was in a way completely against the trend of the time in its anti-neoliberal, anti-free market direction, I would argue. So to be so successful at a time when austerity was preached across Europe is actually quite remarkable. Now, in my presentation, I'm going to go along five particular parts. First of all, I look at the arguments underlying privatizing water and the counter-arguments. I will then look, in order to outline a bit the structural background condition of the ECI, I will look at the structuring conditions in the global economy before I look more in detail at the tensions but also at the factors of success underlying the European Citizens' Initiative. In part four, I want to evaluate its outcomes, its results, before reflecting on the wider lessons to be learned in the conclusions. Now, privatizing water, yeah, well, what are the arguments for, for privatizing water? And if you look at that, uh, the arguments made by, by uh, the big transnational corporations in that area, by economic academics supporting these kind of positions, they emphasize four positive effects. Yeah, if you privatize water and submit it to market competition, A, we, the production of the service would be more efficient, the quality would be higher, Three, there would be a reduction in the costs for consumers. Fantastic. And four, there would be the possibility still for companies to make a profit. Now, if we look at that, I mean, that is fantastic, don't you think so? I mean, for, <coughs> that's almost magic yeah, by simply introducing the competition of the market. I mean, such a fantastic outcome. And when one actually goes to employer associations and their representatives and interviews them, or bought by the public sector in general, they actually believe that. Uh, although, if you look at it logically, this is as this is just <laughs> not sound. But of course, it's not that these people are are not knowledgeable. They're highly knowledgeable. They're highly trained. And of course, these kind of arguments are based on highly complex economic mathematical models, models perhaps which have not much to do with reality, but models which nonetheless sustain this kind of argument. Uh, so these are the, the four fantastic effects, I would argue, apparently the privatization of water would bring us. Now the reality looks, looks rather different. I mean, there's a lot of research being done by PSEO, it is the Public Services International Research Unit at Greenwich <laughs> University in London, where they, would, where they demonstrate clearly where there is no competition. Water is a natural monopoly. But it's not only that it's a natural monopoly, but it's also that we have a case again and again, where the big transnational corporations actually cooperate with others. So rather than competing with each other about particular contracts, they put forward joint bids or they parcel out various bids between each other. That happened in Italy, it happened in the, in the Global South, we can see that again and again. Tariffs are soaring for consumers, prices go up almost immediately the moment private companies come into water provision. There's a chronic lack of investment in infrastructure to maintain <laughs> the services in the long run. And very often the quality of the water is actually poor. And the universal access or the, the spread of water access to, to citizens in general is by no means uh, 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 put forward, driven forward. So and if we think that actually the reality is so poor of private water, I think that also then really makes clear to us that privatization and the arguments around it is not about how we can provide best water to, to, to everyone, but it's actually a struggle around private profits. Yeah, this is a struggle over profits. It's not about how to ensure water access for, 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 for everyone. I wanted to look very briefly at the structure and conditions in the global economy. Where, where does this profit drive, drive come from? And if we look at the capitalist social relations of production, we can see that there's first a relentless focus on competitiveness. Because in a system based on wage labor and the private ownership of the means of production, it's not only workers who have to reproduce themselves through the market by offering their labor power, but also companies reproduce themselves through the market. They are in constant competition with others. They constantly need to soar ahead. And if they don't do so, they may go bankrupt. 
This is where this competitive driven focus comes from, it's a structural condition in the global economy. And this is of course why capitalism to some extent is also so dynamic in its development implications. But of course we also know that as a result of this focus on competitiveness there's a chronic crisis tendency. And David Harvey refers also in view of the current situation to this notion of crisis of over-accumulation. Because there are constantly super profits reaped, but these profits also constantly have to be reinvested into yet other further profitable areas. Yeah, this is part of this competitiveness driven focus. And we reached an ultimately a situation where we have super profits on the one hand, and this is the case here and now, it's not that there's a lack of money at the moment, and on the other hand, high unemployment. And those two factors, these super profits, can no longer be related profitably with, with, with the free labor available within this capitalist system. And this is why we have this crisis of overaccumulation. And as a result of this constant need of crisis, there's also the, the, the crisis tendency, there's the constant need to expand capitalist social relations of production to overcome these crises. This is a geographical dimension. Yeah, capitalism constantly spreads outward in order to incorporate other parts uh, uh, of the globe. But of course, expansion can also take place by recommodifying those areas which have been actually kept outside or put outside the market, such as public services. And this is why water has become so important as, as, a, as a possibility of investment. Yeah? In a moment, especially now in the global economic crisis, where there's a lack of opportunities for capital to invest profitably in areas, water has become a fantastic new growth opportunity in order to make profits. I have a couple of references here. Yeah? Water is the petroleum for the next century, Goldman Sachs. The water market will soon eclipse oil, agriculture and precious metals, Citigroup. These are big investment funds. These are not in the water companies, which heavily uh, uh, focus on water as a possibility to invest these over-accumulated profits uh, uh, afresh. Of course, and then we look at the Eurozone crisis, to some extent, of course, it has been used by these forces of capital to put further pressure towards privatization. Italy, despite the water referendum, was again and again put pressure on from, from Europe, from the Commission, to, to liberalize uh, uh, its public sector, including water. Greece and Portugal have endured heavy pressure to sell off their nationalized water companies in order to, to, to cover their debts. And of course, we know that there are powerful transnational corporations behind these pressures for privatization. Suez, Veolia, the most important ones. And of course, there are, there are pressure groups, Aquafed, specifically for water here in Brussels. But I would argue also the European Services Forum with its much broader remit as far as public services are concerned is crucial here. So clearly when we look at the structuring conditions in the global economy there's a heavy pressure to, to, towards privatizing water in order to overcome the, the systemic crisis within <coughs> the capitalist social relations of production. This is the structural background I would argue of the European Citizens Initiative. Now, when we look at the European Cities Initiative as an alliance of a broad set of different uh, actors, of course, it would be surprising if there had not been tensions within the, 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 the broad alliance. Yeah, sometimes social movements in interviews told me that they were concerned that the campaign had been dominated by trade unions. A local activist in Berlin of the Berliner Wassertisch told me they weren't really given the opportunity to participate in the drafting of the European Citizens Initiative. And these are common concerns in, in, in these kind of uh, situations. Trade unions, in, by contrast, say, well, sometimes we have the impression these social movements just come to us, uh, want our resources, uh, want our cloud, but actually, ultimately, are only interested in running their own running their own uh, 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 campaigns. So of course the, these kind of tensions were also present in, in this particular campaign. There were discussions about how should one ensure that people have 
that the human right of water can actually be, be established. Yet, from within the world water contract movement, some people say water should just be free. And we need a concrete legislative proposal which puts that in place. Whereas other people say, well, hold on a second, we still need to finance water. There needs to be an infrastructure which is being maintained, and water has to have a price. What should not be is that a profit is made. And they would argue then, in contrast to this world water contract movement, that it would be ultimately state responsibility to ensure that people have universal access to, to, to water. So there were these tensions, but ultimately, actually, I think if you look at the, the, the campaign, if you look at the broad variety of, of actors involved in it, it's actually surprising how few tensions that there were in this particular area. And in the following, I want to highlight four particular factors which I think demonstrate or explain why this campaign was so successful, despite the structure, structuring conditions in the global economy putting pressure towards further privatization. And the first one is that really the European Citizens' Initiative comes as a result of a long history of water struggles. First of all, we have the global level. Cochabamba 2000, the water wars. So of course, for those involved, it was a very localized event. But the kind of image of Cochabamba, the way it has been integrated in documentaries or in the film even, even the Rain, indicates that it had a much wider global implication where people for the first time very visibly realized the damaging impact results of water privatization. I would mention the first alternative world water forum in Firenze in 2003, bringing together from around the globe activists, campaigns, actors, trade unions involved in resisting water privatization as a crucial moment of cohering these various disparate uh, uh, attempts of resisting privatization. Resulting in the success of water being declared a human right by the United Nations in 2010. But of course, there have also been the local efforts, the activists, which have long before the ECI actually started to be involved in, in struggles. Water was remunicipalized in Grenoble in 2000, Paris 2010, Berlin 2013. These are all struggles, these are all uh, uh, water activists which then also participated to organize the European Citizens' Initiative on the ground when it came to it. Italian cities since the 2000s bitter struggles over water privatization station and soaring water tariffs. And of course there has been the national level, and I just mentioned the Water Forum in Italy, established in 2006, which had this enormously successful campaign about a national referendum in 2011, directed against the possibility of making profit with water, directed against water privatization. The Water Alliance in Germany too, highly crucial for supporting the ECI, goes back to 2000 when first four forces mobilized there in order to contest liberalization attempts within the German context and later at the European level. So really I would argue the EDI, ECI has ultimately been the coming together of different struggles from local, national and global levels, concretized in a European level effort by EPSU coordinating various <coughs> national campaigns. <coughs> Yeah, it's the result of the coming together of a long history of successful and unsuccessful water struggles. And it comes at a time when there has been a lot of uh, uh, sensitivities already over water uh, uh, being established. And interestingly, actually, the concrete initiative goes back to a pre-meeting of EPSU and its affiliates prior to the 2008 European Social Forum in Miami. And I think it, although that social forum process has been, been dormant, at least at the European level for some time. It does show the kind of salience and importance for resisting privatization of this kind of European level uh, uh, events. But secondly, I also would argue that it's the unique quality of water which ensured that the ECI ultimately was a success. Yeah, many people see water as a fundamental source of life. And that be there also at the Italian uh, uh, referendum, has attracted support far beyond a centre-left or left-wing uh, uh, kind of politics. People on the centre-right, on the right, from within uh, uh, Catholic groups would, would feel a connection to this idea of water 
be being a, 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 a fundamental source of life and therefore being against the idea that profits could be made uh, with that. And one of my, my favorite uh, photos is this from the Italian water campaign, where basically the priest says mass, and on the altar has the Italian flag of the water movement campaign prior to the referendum. And I think it, it shows the, the wide attractiveness of water as an issue, which goes far beyond political, political divisions. I also would argue that it was the broad coverage of the ECI itself which was crucial for the success. And there were three key aspects mentioned, and I mean only very briefly, that it was to ensure universal access to water in the European Union and its members. There was this focus against liberalization of water. And there was the EU policy towards the wider global level, where it was argued that should be focused much more in for favor of guaranteeing across the world that people had access uh, to water. And I think that broad coverage in those three short points allowed the campaign to attract a whole kind, range of different, uh, of different groups. So number one, yeah, it's clearly a social justice issue, and that, as I mentioned just now, was relevant for religious groups, but also all kinds of citizens' movements. Yeah, social justice, if you think about the situation in Detroit at the moment where people are cut off from water because they are not able to, to pay their water bills, these social justice issues, as reflected in number one, uh, have resonance with people. If you think about no liberalization of water, that was uh, in particular important also for trade unions and user groups, because it is known that privatization very often leads to deterioration in working conditions cutting back of the workforce, in case an example in this respect. But even user groups are arguing that, well, we know that privatization brings increases in water tariffs, so they are being part of that. But also some green NGOs who argue the moment the profit motive comes into the water industry, the environment uh, 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 becomes a secondary concern. So for green NGOs, it was also important to, to have no liberalization of water. And finally, the third point yeah, was especially significant for development groups, the idea that we need to push the right to access to water across the globe, also in, in developing countries. So in a way, the way the, how the ECI was phrased, speaking to so many different groups and their concerns, facilitated this kind of successful initiative. <coughs> And finally, I would argue a factor of success was the, was the tight coordination of European and national campaigns. Yeah, we had a key organization at European level coordinating the organization of, of the European level alliance, but also bringing together the various national alliances through their representatives coordinated at European level. It was successful also because we had national campaigns across the European Union. In 2000 to 2003, EPSO had already been involved in organizing an alliance on, for green and social procurement. And they had a very strong European level alliance, but at the time it had not been possible to establish national alliances paralleling the European developments. This was different this time at the European level. And of course, Germany stands out with a vast part of the signatures, but if you look at it, these signatures were collected successfully, the quotas were reached across the European Union, including countries in the core, such as Austria, Belgium, countries in the southern periphery in the Eurozone crisis, Greece, or countries such as Lithuania and Slovenia in Central and Eastern Europe. So it, again, the tight coordination and the success across the European Union are a clear factor why overall the ECI was so successful. So how can we evaluate then the ECI if you look at the outcomes? Uh, two hearings were held on the 17th of February, one with the Commission, one with the European Parliament. And in itself, that's a success because this is the kind of constitutional provision. But the Commission response, those people from the activist groups uh, uh, told me, was disappointing. Uh, it rejected to have a directive on water as a human right. That would be national competency. It said it was going to exclude water from further liberalization, but nonetheless remained neutral because, again, that would be a, 
uh, national level competency. And it also didn't make any promise in view of the EU foreign policy to push more for water uh, as a human right globally. What really came out was this consultation on drinking water, where activists say the European Union, the Commission could have done that even without the, the European Citizens Initiative. Nevertheless, we need to remember the related implications of the campaign. Uh, first, in February 2013, the moment the campaign had actually crossed the one million mark, it was that moment when increasing pressure was felt within the Commission. And first they wanted to have an exception for water for Germany in the Concessions Directive, which was discussed in parallel to the ECI, which does focus on liberalisation, so liberalisation of services, including water initially. And when it turned out that an exception for Germany would be even more problematic, it was then decided to exclude water from the Concessions Directive. And when we look at the pronouncements by the Commission, it's very clear that this came in response to the increasing success of the European Citizens Initiative. So water being taken out of the Concessions Directive, even if it's not a direct visible effect, clearly is a success of the overall campaign. Activists told me that there was a change in public discourse in water. Yeah, it is now possible to criticize privatization and people are not laughed at again. Another important a success. Four out of five candidates for the new president of the commission committed themselves to implementing the human right to water in the elections prior to the elections uh, uh, last year. And of course, there were clear links of transnational solidarity across borders. Yeah. At the here, when activists from Thessaloniki against water privatization, followed by a video link, the proceedings in the European Parliament hearing. They themselves in turn decided to have an independent referendum about privatization in their city. And to that referendum then, on top of that, were delegates sent from the European Water Movement, from EPSO, from the Italian Water Forum. And that campaign then resulted in endorsement of a no vote to water privatization not legally binding, but adding enormous pressure on the Greek state to rethink water privatization. And in the end, it was decided that neither the water service of Thessaloniki nor of Athens would be privatized. So we see how, as a positive result of the ECI, there are these uh, 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 vital links of transnational solidarity supporting ongoing struggles against further privatization. But of course, we have to be careful there is a clause within the concessions directive that there will be a review in five years' time. And there are also concerns over the negotiations of a transatlantic uh, 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 trade and investment partnership and whether water would be included there. And of course, people involved in the struggles in keeping water public know that they keep coming back. Uh, and there's no doubt that from every success to keep water out, it is highly likely that that decision will be contested in the future. So coming to my conclusions, what are the wider implications of the European Citizens Initiative? And I think there are a whole range of follow-up initiatives taking place at the moment at European level. There was a supportive statement by the Economic and Social Committee of the European Union in October 2014, asking the Commission to follow up on the key demands of the initiative. There's an initiative report intended to be prepared by the European Parliament Environmental Committee, which would again ask the Commission to take an official position on the issue. And there's currently a multi-stakeholder dialogue on qualitative benchmarking, which also, in a way, follows up on parts of what was mentioned in the European Citizens Initiative. So there's ongoing uh, ongoing uh, uh, campaigns resulting from the ECI. But I would also argue, and that's a the critical aspect, there's a danger of this exclusive emphasis on EU institutions for a number of reasons. First of all, if you look at the institutional setup of the European form of state, when we call, if you can call it like that, yeah, trade unions and social movements are disadvantaged. Lobbying groups of transnational capital have much better access to the key 
uh, to the key commissions, to the, the key directorates. It is dangerous if you just focus on the European Union considering this kind of institutional situation. We know there's a democratic deficit. Uh, just to think that we can achieve change and maintain change by looking at European institutions is a danger, is a potential trap. And of course, there's a risk of demobilizing forces. Yeah? All those people involved in collecting signatures on the ground, they cannot be involved when you simply lobby within the EU institutional setup here in Brussels or the various capitals. And there's a highly risk his strategy if this is the main focus of the following up campaign. What are the alternatives? Of course there's heavy pushing for public-public cooperation and even the European Union has now made available some money to support this kind of initiatives. But I think when we think about it is also remember that just because water is public it does not mean that it's automatically better administrated. And it was when I was doing interviews with the Italian water movement but they were very aware of the fact that especially the state in Italy had a very bad reputation for nepotism, for in inefficiency. And I think it's one of the key contributions of the Italian water movements to focus on the commons. To argue water is a commons which needs to be enjoyed jointly, but which also needs to be governed jointly. And therefore they put a heavy <coughs> emphasis on combining this focus on the commons beyond the public and the private, with a new form of democracy. A form of democracy where you have the workers of the various companies, plus the user groups of these particular water services involved in, in running these uh, uh, public utilities. To see a new form of democracy, a new type of economy as the way forward, which will truly ensure that we have guaranteed this access to water. And I would argue that it's really in the combination of this focus on the commons and new types of democracy. And we can see that in concrete experiments at the moment, being it in the city of Napoli in Italy, be it in the Spanish city of Saragossa, where we have this kind of involvement by trade unions and user groups in running these companies. I think this is really where we can see a transformational potential towards a new type, type of economy beyond the kind of constraints of the capitalist social relations of production. And if successful, this may also be the model, which can actually then be extended in other areas of public services, be it transport, be it health, be it education. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, for our first respecting uh, at the minute pro. The, the time, we said no more than 30 minutes, exactly no more than 30 minutes. And also to give this kind of very broad perspective, but not only broad perspective, but also precise, and also mixing the, the analysis at European level and national level. And I think that's uh, really important for the, the discussion. Uh, it's not uh, only a, a something which happened uh, at, uh, at EU level, but also in many, uh, many countries and, and with different dynamics that we could discuss uh, later. Now I, I give the floor to... Uh, uh, a key participant because you are you are not only in the parliament but you are also the rapporteur for the initiative so i give you the floor then too uh, thank you um i suppose andreas has sort of set the scene there in terms of the, the privatization but i wanted what i wanted to do today i suppose is also just to kind of re-emphasize that that there's definitely this trend towards privatization to speak about because I'm not only the rapporteur on the right to water, but I'm also Irish, and anybody following the water campaign will be very familiar with what's happening at the moment back in, in Ireland. Um, so as I agree with what Andreas is saying, there's definitely a shift towards the privatisation, and you know, if we look outside of the, the Parliament, um, you know, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, I've seen the figure there, by 2006, the majority of loans for water infrastructure were conditional on privatisation. Um, and it's despite the growing evidence that shows that the private model is not necessarily better. In fact, it usually sees uh, costs go up for, for people using the services, uh, reduction in, in working conditions, but also that money is not invested in the infrastructure, which is always the argument you hear from the private bodies that we need to bring the money in, we need to invest, and we only have to look in, in England and the Thames model that they're saying now to the British government they don't have the money to invest in the, the sewage pipe 
that's required, yet the fact that they're making 30% profits on, on the money that they're bringing in. Um, but I suppose in, in terms of the European Union, absolutely, I, I believe firmly that the Commission has its eyes set on privatisation and we've seen it with Balkenstein about 10 years ago trying to, to bring, uh, to liberalise water. Obviously it was the Parliament that reacted very strongly uh, to that and the idea was shelved but I always believe with the European Union they shelve things, they don't put them away. <laughs> they. Uh, you know, they'll always come back to it. And I think with the economic crash, what we've seen is it was seen as a perfect opportunity to come back to water. Um, you know, the commissioner never wanted to waste a good recession. And they used it as this opportunity. And we only have to look at how they engaged with the countries who were in bailouts. So we've talked about, obviously, the, uh, in Greece, you know, and what we've seen there with the Greek governments were being told that they needed to sell off their majority share in water services. Um, the Italians also had the same pressure put on them. And I suppose at the time when Ireland was receiving uh, love letters from Draghi of the, the European Central Bank about not burning any bondholders, Berlusconi was receiving similar letters about uh, liberalising water services. Um, so you were getting this outside pressure on these countries when they were at particularly vulnerable periods of time. The Portuguese also came under pressure. And I suppose that leads us to where, where we are in Ireland. Um, uh, when the Troika came in, they spotted that they said that Ireland wasn't paying for its water and that that needed to change. So that was part of our bailout agreement that Ireland was now going to have to, to pay for water. And I suppose from the outside, people were like, but sure, everybody else is paying for water. Why are the Irish not paying for water? And I think this is a misconception. And it's, it suits the Irish government at the moment to have that misconception out there. But the Irish, the reason why the Irish mobilised so strongly about this agreement in the bailout is because they do pay for water. <coughs> they pay for it, but they pay for it through general taxation. And the evidence is there. Um, when they tried to increase, in, a, in an odd sort of system in Ireland, when they tried to increase in, uh, motor tax, one of the justifications was that this 2% um, of this would be ring-fenced and go to water services. Uh, the other evidence that's there is that all of the local authorities who had up to this date managed the water infrastructure, they get a budget from central government. We have a very centralised system in Ireland and the <coughs> local authorities have very few powers. But the budget they received had in it very detailed, this money is ring-fenced for water services and it's coming from general taxation. So Irish people were very much aware of the fact that they were paying for water. Um, I suppose what they also wouldn't have disputed was the fact that we did have a huge need for infrastructure investment. There was frustration that the Irish government during all of the good times didn't invest in that infrastructure. In some areas of Dublin we have 40% leakage, uh, we have lead piping that needs replacing. Uh, other parts of rural Ireland have boil notices on their, their water. So nobody is questioning the fact that we have a serious problem with water in Ireland. The, the issue is how do we resolve that problem. Um, so. I suppose just also on that, in terms of the, the Troika deal and, and what led to all of the protests, uh, the Irish government agreed to bringing in domestic water charges, but instead of amalgamating the local authorities into what the eight river basin catchment uh, regions that we have in Ireland, they set up a single body called Irish Water, and it was established with 80 million euros worth of consultancy fees. Um, and also, I think for the Irish people, it certainly raised alarm bells because you're going, why are we introducing this one big monolith body if it's not that we're going to sell it down the line? Uh, it makes it much easier to privatise your water if you have a single body. And they'll talk about, we have to keep it off balance sheet because we're a bailout country, so we'll sell off a few shares. And where does that stop? So... The, the water protest in Ireland, we kind of, I suppose, were ignorant in a way to the Right to Water campaign, the Citizens Initiative, when it was really gaining headway in Ireland. I think we were quite low on the signatures, but it was only because we, there was a delay in the domestic water charges coming in, so people weren't, it wasn't on their radar. It certainly is on, on their radar now. And one of the key elements, apart from the introduction of the charges, was this idea of privatisation. 
So when, when people were questioned why were they out on the streets marching, some of them said they didn't want to pay for water. Uh, some of them were saying we already do pay for water, as I said, they were well aware. And then you had uh, people, particularly in, you know, you had people on the streets from areas, like you saw the picture with the church, but you had people on the streets from very middle class parts of Dublin, and their key concern was around the, the, the privatisation. Um, there were calls for a referendum. And I remember my, my colleague uh, from the government party, who's an MEP in Dublin, said, sure, it would be a ridiculous idea to have a referendum. That's just nonsense. Obviously unaware of the fact that these referendums are happening in other European countries. Um, so they've been, that's been dismissed. And what the, the Irish government have offered as a compromise is to legislate that a government would have to approve if Irish water was ever to be privatised down the road. Now, anybody who understands politics at all will say, well, another government can come in and just reverse that legislation. You can't reverse a referendum. If it goes into the Constitution, it'll take another referendum to reverse it. So it's, it, for us now, we're moving to where do we go with the Irish pro, with, uh, campaign because it's still, this is a big fundamental issue for us, is this uh, privatisation. Um, I suppose just in terms of, of myself then in the... Uh, the rapporteur of the right to water, the reason why I really wanted to take it on was because of the issues in Ireland and to really raise it to another level again in Ireland and saying, you know, this is a real problem. Privatisation is on the agenda of, of the Commission. Um, so I think the success of the ECI, and we've seen, you know, what you've outlined, Andres, a lot of the uh, why it worked, um, you know, how it mobilised. I think you're right, water is different. There's something fundamental about water that garners a much greater uh, momentum about social movements. I also thought it was interesting when you said about the, the tensions within it, because we see similar tensions with the, the water campaign in Ireland, and people saying the trade unions are taking over it, and, or the politicians are taking over it. And so it is, I think that's a problem of the left, usually. We, <laughs> we all agree on what the end goal is, but sometimes we disagree on how we get there. Um, so we, we, that's very reflective of what's going on in Ireland. Um, I think, from my point of view of, of being rapporteur of this ECI, I think it's a key opportunity to lend its weight to the Citizens' Initiative, like what we've had from the Economic and Social Affairs Committee. The more pressure that comes on the Commission to act on this and act on it in a manner that's appropriate and not to try and dismiss it like they did with, with the actions uh, on you know, looking at a report into drinking water. I think there's a real opportunity um, and I think we need to flag up those opportunities and to be very uh, strong in how we, we put that out there. There's an opportunity because it is the first citizens initiative, the first successful one. So this was always flagged as being the way to re-engage with citizens in Europe. And I remember during the Lisbon Treaty, all of those who were very much in favour of us were saying, this is fantastic, this is you know, re-empowering the citizens of Europe. We were always had a problem that the commission only had to note that what you you know your citizens initiative. So I think there's a real uh, opportunity for us because the commission are under pressure. We see with the Eurobarometer polls that citizens feel more disengaged and disenfranchised by the European institutions than ever before. So it's up to us to make that politics and to capitalise on it to put the pressure on the the commission. This is huge. It's the biggest. It wasn't only the most success, uh, the first successful one. It was the biggest. It was 1.9 million signatures. Um, they need to listen to the people, and they, if, if the commission are interested in doing, even if it's a PR exercise, this we need to make sure that it's the right to water one that they're going to act on. Um, I also think that part because part of the the citizens initiative was around global universal uh, access to water and the un resolution 2015 is the european year of development we have also there an avenue that we need to explore and to put pressure the development committee and the parliament are going to be offering the opinion on it so we need to ensure that they step up to the plate and so there's an opportunity again because of the year that's in us to to push it so like, I really believe that we have in our hands, it, the, the timing is right for this to succeed, but we have to work together as a social movement. Um, 
I agree with you. I don't think it can be only focused. The issue around privatisation war can't be only focused on the EU institutions. But I do think with the Citizens Initiative that we have at the moment a perfect opportunity to really push this if we can work together, if we can get a document that says what we want it to say, but that will get, I suppose, past the Parliament. So it needs to be carefully uh, thought out um, and carefully written so that it gets what our objectives are um, and it gets it passed so that it puts the pressure on the Commission. And I, I, I do think we need to seize that opportunity. And I suppose for myself as a rapporteur, I have met quite a few of you in the room, but I want to engage with everybody on this and to hear their feedback because that was the success of the ECI was that it drew in people from all the strands all working together. And I think, as I said, we have a perfect opportunity to ensure that we get the best possible outcome from the Parliament, which will put the pressure on the Commission, which hopefully will get the best possible outcome from them then. So I'll leave it there. <coughs> Okay, thank you. I think also you, you uh, have an uh, illustrator, or uh, it's not the end of a, a process. It, 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 you have still a, a dynamic, and in the dynamic, you have pressure and strong pressure, and certainly on the, the weakest uh, countries or weakest uh, link to return to the previous uh, uh, agenda. And now uh, the question is also I uh, uh, turn to to Jan Willem, perhaps he has already some idea about the future, or to guarantee the progress and the gain, which were uh, partial. Uh, in the case uh, of discussion in Ireland, it was clear at European level also uh, with the, the revision of, of the concession uh, directive. And uh, I think that that's uh, uh, rather interesting to think about not only the initiative and what were the results, but in looking forward, uh, what could be the, the condition to, to keep the gain uh, we had with this uh, initiative. So I think you have a, a mic just next to you. I do? And yes, and you just push on. And on. I think... Yeah, uh, it should work. And I think... It doesn't, doesn't work. work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should not. I think <laughs> it works now. Yeah. Maybe what should not think uh, so much. Um, with this sort of uh, discussion and with the analysis made by uh, Andreas, uh, you would be... I would be very pleased if you would have thought through everything, how it comes out and how it is uh, presented. Eh? And um, Some of the things we did think through, uh, some of the things happened by, not by accident, but in the course of the campaign, uh, other consequences uh, we did not uh, foresee. Uh, maybe first for you, uh, a little bit about EPSU, for those of you who don't know uh, us, uh, we are a European Trade Union Federation, member of the ETUC. Uh, within EPSU we bring together public service unions with membership in the public and in the private sector uh, for the in exchange of information, uh, discussions, uh, making our policies, but essentially also to influence the decisions uh, our employers, uh, governments, and also European institutions uh, try to make and we also mobilize for action uh, and change. So we were the initiator of the first European citizen initiative that has become successful. Successful already in the first 12 months. Uh, so the deadline uh, is 12 months and we were the first and still the only one which achieved the success in 12 months. There have been two others which have been successful but they took 18 uh, months uh, for their uh, collection of signatures. We did not do it alone. Uh, we were the initiator. We have been driving the campaign. We have been coordinating it, uh, as Andreas was indicating, but we certainly didn't do it uh, alone. Many of the colleagues who are here, many of the uh, representatives in the water movement uh, uh, assisted us uh, and helped uh, to collect, drive, the campaign also in their own uh, countries. And Andreas says there has been uh, some criticism, some tension. I would, uh, I will not flatly deny it, uh, but uh, uh, we should not make too much of it in a very broad movement uh, as what we, as which was behind uh, the citizen initiative. Of course, you have discussions, you have uh, differences uh, of opinion. Uh, but in the end, uh, we all agreed that we wanted to do this uh, together, uh, and uh, we have done it uh, also. 
I think what I'm very pleased with, uh, and I think Louisa uh, later on will also uh, indicate that, and I think Lynn uh, also mentioned that, but I'm very pleased with, with the analysis of Andreas, uh, is that he places the European Citizen Initiative back in the social movement struggle. I mean, we have been working for years uh, leading up uh, to uh, our discussions uh, to do this with uh, local initiatives, European uh, colleagues, to actually try uh, and influence uh, what is happening in the European uh, water sector. There have been many local water struggles in which we, our members, uh, have engaged, in which others have engaged. And one of the biggest successes of all of us, uh, EPSU, but also the European water movement uh, in a broad sense, is a success which you actually don't see, which is that water is still not liber uh, liberalized uh, at European level. Uh, you were referring to the uh, Bolkestein Directive, you were referring to the procurement uh, discussions. There have been initiatives to start preparing uh, the liberalization, the opening up of the water sector at European level, and that has been uh, prevented. One of the important things for us in uh, doing the campaign was indeed to try to link up the different local struggles. Uh, I mean, if you're a local activist, sometimes you have your uh, or a local trade unionist in your own uh, local fight and sometimes you can feel uh, isolated or distanced uh, from uh, other fights and one of the things indeed we tried to do was link these, uh, link these fights uh, together and the ECI was one of the opportunities to do so. We also wanted to do the ECI because one of the things we did foresee uh, was that there would be further attempts uh, to liberalize water services I think the point uh, Lynn made uh, is uh, when the Commission or Commission services want something, uh, they will try to continue pushing it. Uh, this would be a little criticism of Andrea's work, uh, where uh, the, um, the analysis, uh, the academic analysis, should also focus on a bureaucratic perspective. Bureaucracies have their own. Um, objectives as well, and uh, this was uh, one, and they continue uh, with what they want uh, to achieve. And so we did foresee that the Commission would come back with liberalizing water services, and they actually did. Uh, the concession directive was one such attempt, the trade agreements uh, are uh, another attempt, I come back uh, to that. I think what is helpful with the analysis of Andreas uh, is also that it demonstrates that there are actors who want to achieve also the liberalization uh, of the water sector. He referred to the water companies and uh, the big multinational companies, to some of their lobby organizations. Uh, and in the discussion around the concession directive, uh, it was often argued, yeah, but we as Commission, we don't talk about privatization. We as Commission are not wanting to promote uh, the liberalization of water services. Well, it's been very revealing that in the reaction uh, to, uh, when the European Commission reacted to the ECI uh, and the enormous surge in signatures in a number of countries, and especially Germany, uh, and they removed the water sector from the concession directive, Aquafet, the uh, uh, lobby organization for the private water sector, published a press release in which it actually pointed out uh, that over half of the concessions in Europe are in the water uh, sector. And so I think we were right on target and right uh, with our uh, critique. Uh, Borkestein has been mentioned, also Borkestein and the services of the Commission prepared proposals to liberalize water services which we also uh, stalled. And we, uh, the European water movement including uh, the unions. One of the Amazing things with the water campaign, and I think uh, when Lynn is talking about the, the events going on in Ireland, is something we experienced also, is the amazing energy uh, there is at local level uh, at the campaign. The messages during the campaign we got uh, from people engaging, pensioners, people who were collecting uh, signatures in shops, uh, at universities, uh, and I think that has been uh, for us also very uh, rewarding. Uh, rewarding also the effects, as I said earlier, which we didn't foresee. Uh, the way in which the European Citizen Initiative played a role in Thessaloniki, uh, the incredible uh, result in Thessaloniki, 98% of citizens who said no uh, to water uh, privatization, underlining again uh, the point uh, made earlier. We were 
disappointed with the commission of the uh, with the reaction of the European Commission. Uh, I think we said it lacked uh, ambition. It lacked ambition because the Commission didn't do shit. Excuse me, the more uh, with the uh, with the demand of the uh, ECI to actually propose legislation to introduce the human right to water in you in the uh, in European. Uh, in, the, in the European Union based on the United Nations right to water and the right to water is already recognized mind you uh, the majority of European Union governments abstained or voted against the Europe uh, the human right uh, to water in the UN uh, and they didn't do uh, anything with it they could have done they could have introduced amendments to for example the water framework directive it has a frame uh, which allows uh, the implementation uh, of this right uh, at national uh, level, for example. Uh, they could have done something and they didn't uh, do. And of course they failed the 1.9 million people and many others uh, who uh, were associated uh, in this. Yeah. I think that is uh, a point Lynn uh, stressed. Um, the European Citizen Initiative as an instrument I would say is almost about to die. Yeah. I'm going to put a little bit of pressure on you and your colleagues. If the European Parliament doesn't do anything with this initiative, which has broad support, which has also in the hearing broad support of all the political parties apart from uh, two French MEPs, which we know were in the well, we're on camera, we, which we know have been also in contact with uh, the uh, private water uh, lobby uh, from France, um, and uh, some liberal uh, MEPs of the ultradox, uh, the market is better uh, than anything else. All the other MEPs, all the other political parties in the European Parliament were in favour of the human right to water were also not in favour of liberalisation of water services. So there is a very broad support. I mean, it's not for nothing that four of the candidates for uh, European Commission presidents actually took pictures with us, supported the campaign. Uh, uh, if you allow me an aside, uh, in Greece we will have elections uh, this weekend, uh, which for some debates are elections uh, of also hope of something new and the leader of uh, the Greek party, uh, which is leading in the opinion polls, has supported also this initiative. So uh, we have uh, high expectations. But also Juncker did, uh, also Schulz, uh, commission, uh, the parliament president, uh, did uh, as well. Only for Hofstadt, the liberal uh, leader, didn't, uh, didn't do that. Um, as I said earlier, uh, liberals have sometimes a uh, somewhat other uh, view uh, of things. Um, so there is indeed a lot of potential to get it done, but if it doesn't happen, I think the ECI by activists will be seen as a completely useless <coughs> instrument. Uh, and then the, uh, those who had a corporate perspective of the ECI uh, perspective to try to regulate it, box it in, make it very difficult, will actually uh, have, won, uh, have won the day. Uh, so there is, uh, there is a big uh, question here also for European uh, democracy. One of the fights uh, we also have, uh, uh, Andreas referred to it briefly, uh, when referring to the TTIP, uh, uh, this, these are the negotiations with the United States uh, to uh, introduce the uh, trade uh, and investment uh, partnership uh, between the US and the uh, European Union, but actually you also have CETA, that's the agreement with, is already concluded between the EU uh, and Canada. And you have the ongoing, ongoing the uh, negotiation on TISA, which is the agreement on trade uh, in services. Uh, there is a risk that these agreements again uh, put pressure on opening uh, of services. Drinking water is not part uh, in uh, CETA uh, of what is uh, committed to be opened up, but water uh, sanitation services are. Uh, and if we are told uh, we want to achieve, how, should they, how do they say that they want to achieve a golden standard of trade agreements, well, why, uh, from a trade union perspective, we say, why are there no trade union rights included? Uh, why are there no new rights included? Well, from the water campaign, why is the right to water not recognized in these agreements straight away? I mean, don't discuss it. I mean, recognize the right to water uh, in these agreements. And it's not done. Uh, and that reveals another agenda 
and we're back again with the private sector lobby, the European Services Forum, uh, and other uh, pri uh, uh, corporate uh, corporate interest. Um, some final comments uh, in terms of uh, how and why we succeeded um, and, and the lessons uh, we've learned. Well, the biggest lesson we have learned uh, on the, uh, certainly in EPSO, but I think we can all learn, is that it's doable. You can do a European citizen initiative. You can exactly, you can actually uh, succeed. So we can have the confidence uh, to, uh, to do it. I think it's important as a lesson uh, that it's part of ongoing uh, struggles, something EPSO has participated in uh, and uh, brought to uh, fruition, uh, brought to a success. Another lesson is actually we're not talking about a citizen initiative. Uh, it's citizens who write up, uh, but it's not citizens who organize it. I mean, you need organizations to do it, uh, organizations with a network of uh, activists uh, like trade unions but also in the water movement resources uh, to do it uh, I don't know if you, uh, you didn't mention it uh, but we also put uh, a lot of resources uh, into it and as we are now noticing you also need the resources and the organization to follow on to follow up uh, to be in contact with uh, the likes of Lil to be Lynn to be in contact with the European Economic and Social Committee I think there's uh, some the Colleague who made the uh, uh, report is actually here, or at least I saw her later, so she might want to say something uh, on that. And so you need the resources also to follow it up, the organization to follow it up. One of the points uh, Andreas touched upon uh, is something we are concerned about, is the, uh, with the focus, with moving to the discussions here in Brussels, what does it do for the mobilizing potential? Eh? The, uh, the, the fact that so many people were uh, involved uh, and one of the things we do foresee uh, is to pick up also that element again uh, nearing uh, World Water Day on the 22nd of March. Uh, we will see uh, if we can organize also with colleagues in the water movement further activities uh, to continue to make our, our voice also visible uh, at European level. Uh, so that is a concern and something we uh, will be trying to uh, pick up. Another unintended, uh, not foreseen consequences is what, uh, what Andreas pointed out, is that in many more countries there's now actually discussion about public participation uh, in the management of public uh, companies. Uh, also that is becoming more and more uh, common uh, as something we work on uh, as social movement. And I think that is very, uh, how should I think the English word is, exhilarating uh, to see that, uh, to see that uh, happening. And with that, uh, I want to uh, finish off. And so we have a good prospect of achieving something, mm -hmm. something which uh, brings uh, success to us, uh, but it will require a little bit of further work also with the European Parliament uh, to, uh, to bring it to its full uh, potential. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jan Willem, and I, I think you are you return to two uh, important points. Uh, one was uh, it was uh, at the beginning of, of uh, the presentation of uh, Andres. It's also a global question, uh, and with the uh, event in, in Latin America, Cochabamba, uh, and others. Uh, and you return with the, the treaty and the pressure that we uh, could have from, from the, the uh, trade agreement. So it's not only a local, national, European level, but the game is much more. Uh, complex and the second one is uh, something that uh, is important I, I think uh, to reflect uh, on is the question uh, about the link between structure and movement and also the tension between structure and movement because that uh, when there is an alliance between trade unions and, and social movements uh, then there is also a need when you enter in this kind of bureaucratic game with the commission to have a structure and that's interesting to to see for, for the future uh, what we, we can learn from uh, this experience. And Noah, I, I give, a, uh, perhaps she will also a little bit uh, elaborate uh, about that, uh, the, the floor to Louisa, who also did uh, research on, on the topic to, to give uh, uh, her opinion about uh, the success and the failure and how to analyze uh, the right to, to water uh, movement. Thank you. Um, yeah, as Jan Willem said and you just said, I'd like to focus a little bit more precisely on the fact that this is really a social movement 
issue and not just structure within social movement coalitions but the tension between the structure of the EU itself and the structures or lack thereof as is sort of the definition really of, of social movements. Um, so perhaps this is quite appropriate to end on but I'd sort of like to open up a little bit to the significance of European citizens initiatives um, in, in a democratic sense and think a little bit about what the right to water citizens initiative demonstrated in those terms. So I'd like to say a little bit about um, the salience of, of, of themes that were quite common in uh, wider anti-austerity protests and movements across Europe that came through the right to water campaign. And again, as Andreas uh, mentioned in his presentation as well, the significance of managing to get those messages to the European Union level at this point in its history, which is no mean feat, I think. So um, the small piece of research I did on Right to Water, um, what well, I've done with it so far in the paper that's been mentioned, uh, looks at how it was framed, so how it was argued, the, the kinds of ideas that were brought up to the European level. And obviously there's two central elements there about the human right to water and um, public goods, but quite a flexible message of public goods that precisely allows this idea of the commons to come in as well. And those are two ideas that struck a chord I found with other research I've done on the argumentation of anti-austerity protest across Europe in um, a, a project called Subterranean Politics in Europe. Um, Italy has been mentioned quite a few times, and I think it's a very good example of how these uh, uh, messages uh, combined, where <laughs> ideas of public ownership and management um, and the commons as democracy, so not just as communal management of you know, a, a public good, but how you can express your opinion and your voice and your participation through that has, has come out. So having a say in how public or common goods are run is also a call for a democracy. And trying to bring these ideas to the European level precisely through a petition is also about democracy. So there's quite a, 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 a they chime quite well. So the very choice of a European citizens initiative I think is quite significant there. Um, and the flexibility of that message in the normal kinds of conversations you have in large alliances between movement groups, between EU groups, allowed those messages to come up to the EU level. So there we find quite an interesting kind of coherence between what's going on wide, more widely in Europe and this quite formal mechanism of bringing citizens' voices up to the European level. So that's all very well and good, but as Andreas also said this is particularly significant in the current context. So the alliance between movements um, and groups within that movement who are more organised and less organised, who are based in Brussels, who are based in small towns and villages and, and, and different nation states, has always been a challenge for EU campaigns. And that's for a variety of reasons that have been mentioned already. But some of those, as I, I, I said at the beginning, I think are due to the very structure of the EU. So it takes uh, you know, a, an office in Brussels, it takes a lot of expertise, it takes a lot of knowledge, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money to engage in European policy processes. And often for uh, groups that are more socially uh, inclined, that's a lot of resources stretching that can't cover things like working on building alliances with movements, building alliances with local groups and national groups. So doing both of those jobs can be very difficult. So the EU itself demands a kind of structure that does not really allow you often to build alliances with social movements. The financial crisis and the big push towards more liberalisation, etc., has kind of exacerbated that problem even more. So Andreas mentioned the importance, actually, of the European social forums in, in the genesis of this water movement. 
What happened with the financial crisis, of course, is that the European social movements, the global justice movement, is now dormant. We're not seeing them. We're not seeing them at European councils, etc. What we have seen them regroup in is things like Occupy. We're seeing them in Syntagma Square in Athens, in the 15M movement in Spain. We're seeing them actually expressed through the water movement in Italy quite a lot in past years. So bringing the messages of a movement that has retrenched back to the very localised physical level of occupying a local square, of engaging in very local and very immediate struggles, the immediate threats of the austerity agenda, bringing those messages back to the European level, I think, is really quite significant. And that's something that the Right to Water Citizens Initiative has done. Then we come to the threat that the very mechanism of the Citizens Initiative is under, and this is where I join Jan Willem's plea to the European Parliament. I've done work on other campaigns in Europe, and something that comes up again and again in campaigns that seem to have some impact, to have some effect on European policy, is precisely the alliance of EU groups and movements and it's the European Parliament putting pressure on the Commission. So this is something we really, it's, it's a combination of things that we um, uh, need to push, I think. Because there are a, a, a lot of dangers in the fact that the Commission had a rather disappointing reaction to this citizens initiative and also to other citizens initiatives and not just the ones that they accepted. Of course, we're seeing TTIP which was not accepted at all as an ECI, although they're using it quite effectively to get a lot of publicity and a lot of mobilisation anyway, it's a different kind of, of a, a mechanism. So what we do need to do is think about the threat that the mechanism, mechanism is under, the burnout that people might have if they continue to see citizens' initiatives that don't get a reaction. And I think that's especially important if we think about the potential that Right to Water has shown this mechanism to have in terms of bringing citizens' voices to the European <coughs> Union at a very crucial time in its history where, to be frank, if it doesn't bring citizens' voices back in, in some way, it's it, it is at great risk, which I think we all think would probably be quite a shame. So I shall uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. So we had uh, four very rich presentations uh, and uh, already a beginning of, of a very interesting uh, conversation be between the, the four uh, speakers. So the time for question, remark. That's, if you can present yourself. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mark Sapir. Um, I was in ETY many years ago. Uh, so I just have just a, a question about, uh, to complete the picture, I would like to know what's, how you would say, what is the strategy of the multinationals? What is what they are saying after this event, what, how they have interpreted the, from their point the result of the campaign, and what you would say are the key focus what they are declaring publicly. I'm not saying what they are doing on, on the sides, but uh, just to complete uh, the picture, because I think it's important, uh, and to see also how it works between uh, the national level in these groups and the uh, European level. Are they any type of uh, diverging view, or, are, or do they have any convergence view after this campaign? Because it seems to me that it's quite important to see if the campaign had also impact on the <coughs> multinationals or on, the, on their supporters, if it had or not. It just, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your work. Okay, other questions? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is David Sanchez from Food and Water Europe, so part of the water movement that tends to be a bit critical. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, my, uh, following what the last speaker said about uh, how this uh, tool like the ECI can create some frustration sometimes in grassroots activists that we have experienced when uh, uh, the TTAP ECI was launched and there was a debate on whether it was worth it to engage into an ECI or not. And uh, people were using the Right to Water initiative as an example of a successful initiative. I, th I think that from the Brussels level, uh, we can see that, okay, uh, we didn't get like the, our objective uh, that was declared in the ACI, but we managed to do a lot of things. But uh, what I could feel is that from the grassroots uh, level, it was more like a um, kind of a frustra frustrating feeling in which we set the standards really high, the expectancies really high, and then uh, like uh, we were running like a proactive campaign, so this time we're going to achieve something and a positive message and, <laughs> and the results, like the outcomes that we immediately get uh, are more like a, like a reactive, you know? like we block the water in the concession directive. And so although, for example, our, our assessment from Food and Water Europe is really positive about, about the ECI and we were encouraging people to engage in the TTAP ECI, although it was rejected by the European Commission, but I would like to, yeah, to know your assessment if uh, you would really encourage encourage uh, activists to get into using this tool, like the DCI, the way it is now, or or not. Okay. Who is the next? Yes. Thank you. Um, I um, I am from uh, ECOSOC in uh, European ECOSOC and uh, CGT uh, in France. Uh, trade union, uh, I mean workers union, and um, you mentioned that uh, uh, there were uh, in October 2014 uh, an opinion from the ECOSOC uh, on the, the initiative, and we raised, it was adopted with a quite large majority, and uh, um, we raised the question about um, let me have, um, about uh, um, recognition by the <laughs> uh, Jan uh, raised the, the issue recognition by the member states for a human rights um, um, issue and uh, their action towards this uh, point and also the commission position and so and also there were uh, resolution for the European Parliament about it. So this is quite a, uh, an issue. But there is a second issue, it's about the uh, consolidation, let's say, of non-profit uh, character of uh, the use of water. And we raised the point that maybe if it was necessary to, under the Article 14 of uh, the Treaty for uh, European Union, on the general interest and non-economic general interest to separate the use um, for the, let's say, vital and domestic, let's say, use and the uh, citizen right for water, to separate the issue from the uh, use for industry and agriculture. And we suggested to the Commission to examine this point from the treaty uh, point of view, if it could facilitate the recognition of a, a right, like in the chart of a fundamental right or any else place in the treaty, if it could facilitate, if we examine a different point, uh, let's say a different uh, um, a view of, of the use, if it is from the citizen's view or if it is from the agriculture and history. And and industrial use. And uh, although we had a large majority on this uh, opinion, uh, the uh, multinational and the companies didn't uh, take the time, I don't know if it was because they didn't really had a position on this, but they didn't came against this, let's say, suggestion. Mm -hmm. So what do you think as a trade union uh, movement and as a researcher view or of this um, approach, because should we uh, uh, push it 
more or uh, is it a bad idea to, to raise this uh, separated uh, use of water and allocation of the resources for the, uh, its preservation and so on? Thank you. Okay, someone else, yes. Hello, Nathan Cooper from the University of Lincoln. Um, I wondered, to what degree you think there's actually a conflict between privatisation and the human rights of water? Because I think that, that seems to have come through from a lot of, of what's been said. Um, if we think about this in the context of another country or another um, global context, like um, in South Africa, for instance, there you've got quite a well-established right to water. Um, and yet you have water services provided um, by um, a combination of private and public actors. So, yeah, I just wonder whether we can maybe explore that, that, that relationship or that conflict. Okay. <coughs> Other? Okay. Um, three questions uh, for each uh, of the, uh, the panelists. Uh, the, one, uh, the first one uh, is for... Uh, the two, uh, let's say, academic. Uh, w in the discussion uh, and also in a question, uh, the, there, is, there was the, the question about the, 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 the alliance between NGOs and, and, uh, and trade unions uh, and the quality of, of the uh, alliance. Uh, my question is that kind of uh, campaign at increase or perhaps decrease the, the trust between the, the, the partners because that's a, a big change, like that you had generally social movement and have a kind of clear goal or achievable goal. Here you had that with some arguing it was not so bad, others say, okay, a lot of uh, effort for a little result. But what for the next phase, uh, do you think that uh, from your study was a good thing, knowing that we have very little uh, at European uh, level? Uh, the second uh, is for Jan Willem. Uh, uh, what about the, because you were, uh, I think, the, the main sources of, of money, what about the, the funding uh, for, for, for the, the next step? Because the, if you want to keep an alliance, you need to, uh, to have some money. And as we know, the trade unions movement doesn't have too much money uh, and don't uh, expect to have much more members in, in the very near future. Uh, so do you have to do uh, some choice where you want to uh, invest? So my question is, do you, do you want to, to uh, continue to invest to guarantee some, some of the gain or, or is it difficult? And uh, secondly, uh, are you ready uh, to have a kind of uh, another initiative? So not tomorrow, but uh, if the next year uh, there is another opportunity, you will uh, redo the, the same uh, or you prefer to uh, wait a little bit. Uh, uh, and, and for Lina, I think that that's uh, uh, all the, 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 the presentation and the question puts in evidence the, the importance of, of the role uh, of the European Parliament. And generally speaking, I think that the in, uh, European initiative, the vision is that we will like that the Commission is doing uh, something. And from the, the, the previous one, what we have kind of uh, feeling is that the Commission is not doing uh, a lot uh, and even disregard some uh, initiatives say, okay, we not even for the TTIP uh, examine well, your, your request. So it put uh, a lot of pressure on the European Parliament. European Parliament, uh, sorry, it's a little bit lo longer question, uh, has also changed uh, as I, I think uh, if you look to, to kind of long term, uh, each revision of treaty a little bit more poorer, and now with the, the election of the president of the commission, something, I would not argue a regime change, but uh, at least the balance of, of power between the European Parliament and the Council has a little bit uh, uh, changed with, with the, the, the last uh, uh, election for, for, for the commission. So, do you have uh, any uh, strategic discussion within the Parliament to say, okay, we should use the uh, European initiative uh, as something that could reinforce for the citizen the role of the parliament, uh, trans group, uh, saying, okay, that we, we should uh, clearly uh, have internal procedures saying that we will take that much more seriously than, than the commission and uh, we will like to have results or we will return uh, every two years on the questions or something like, like that. That's the question, very long, sorry, uh, for you. Uh, but it lets a uh, last chance for the audience to uh, have a short question. Good. 
the mic is somewhere. Uh, okay, there is, it was again here. It's here. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Hanley. I am from the European Commission, but not speaking for it. So, European citizen. Um, I listen with great interest. Um, clearly, the issues about the water element of this are very mixed, and as a number of the panel have said, there isn't an absolute right model or not. Even in the pr public sector, there is a huge deficit of investment, and I know from my own first years in the public servant in the UK, my local authority had an appalling record of investment. So. There, was, there is need for change, as our MEP from Ireland has said. The question I want to ask more is about how do you see this initiative and the success of it, entre guillemets, in the broader context of participatory democracy in the EU? Um, you've talked about how you should or should not have more of these. In the Commission, you'll be aware increasingly we are trying to be transparent in theory. We're having more and more open consultations. Recently there was one in TTIP, 150,000 people responded. A very clear message. Um, I don't know whether the researchers are looking at how the Commission actually listens to the messages coming out of its own consultations, but how do you see the future of these kinds of initiatives alongside these kinds of things where the Commission is actually asking punctual questions in a, in a particular time scale and possibly many people would feel it more focused to answer those sorts of things rather than launch off in things which are going to have a long time frame and come up with a broad range of messages. I mean, looking at your results, it was such a broad message you were passing. Different people in the Commission looked at it in different ways. But So the role of citizens' initiatives in an evolving picture of participatory democracy and how are you going to look at it? Okay, uh, we we'll start with Andreas, the same order, perhaps okay. Andreas. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for, for the range of very interesting uh, questions. Perhaps the, the first two speakers mentioned that there perhaps was also some disappointment from, from the grassroots felt about the, the ECI and the outcome and whether it's actually worthwhile to, to use it. And I think if one looks at that, the, the effects of DCI, I think it was very useful in the sense of bringing together the various local and national campaigns into an overall uh, 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 initiative. And that also brought to the various activists a very different understanding of the overall situation. I was speaking to people from the Water Committee in Arezzo, uh, an Italian uh, city in the center of Italy, and they said, well, we underestimated the importance of the European level in our struggles for access to water. And as a result of the European Citizens Initiative, they have become much more aware of it. But of course, is, is it useful? I think it is useful, but only if it's not just seen as a tool in itself. It needs to be linked to much wider mobilization. And it's important that there's a follow-up, which of course affects the European institutions, but a follow-up which also goes beyond that, so that these water activists are not just, okay, we've done that, and now it's no longer an, an issue. But as such, as a tool, I think it, it's highly, highly, uh, potentially of high importance. Was there an increase or decrease of trust between partners? And I think there was definitely an increase. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm on, on those water activists directly uh, participating in the initiative. And I think they have new relations have been built which will have repercussions not just at European level but also in, in local struggles and perhaps the success <coughs> of the, the water referendum in Thessaloniki and the international solidarity shown to that is, is, an, example, uh, uh, is an example of that. So I think there's definitely an, an increase in, in, in trust as, as a result of that. Participatory democracy, I think people would, would view that as one part, but I think activists would also say, well, when it came to the EIP, the Commission then rejected <coughs> the idea that an ECI could be started on that. And so I think there would, there would be questioning whether it's actually a serious measure uh, uh, from the Commission to increase uh, uh, direct democracy in this particular area. I saw a very, very important question about this conflict between privatization and human rights, and I actually 
if one goes on these company websites, they would also speak in favor of the human right to water. Yeah, that's pu part of their public discourse. But I think and in the German campaign initially there was a, uh, 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 an organization called Board for the World, Bread for the World, aligned to the Protestant churches in Germany. And they stressed initially, we want the human right to water. We are not so much worried about public or private maintenance. But over time, because of the results of private water, with more and more awareness of the disastrous consequences that it did not lead to a spread of water access when you privatized companies, but it did not lead to an increase in infrastructure. I think there's an increasing awareness that actually private water cannot live up to the requirements of the human right to water. And as a result, I think, as a result of practice, one can uh, uh, say that there is a clear conflict between private water and the human right to water. And then finally, interesting comment of the Economic and Social Committee. I think perhaps it could be a good strategy to separate that, but that would depend a bit then on your experience of what is the response by, by the, 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 the corporations yeah, in, in view of this idea to separate domestic use and industrial agricultural use. And perhaps some groups involved in, in, in food production right of access to food, they would query because then again you have this focus on industrialized agriculture where there is perhaps a movement more away from this large industrialized way of producing agriculture. But I think it's probably more, you are probably the one who may be better able to, to answer that question as a result of your practical engagement. Okay, Luisa? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, right. Um, yeah, so um, just quickly in terms of the uh, sort of increasing or de decreasing of, of, of trust, obviously I wouldn't claim to speak on behalf of anybody who was involved in the ECI, but more generally I'd say in, in the sort of wider studies I've done is that this kind of coalition is not as common as it was before the financial crisis really set in, and it wasn't very common before that. So, um, which kind of clashes with the finding that it tends to be that kind of coalition that actually makes an impact on policy. So I think the ECI in that sense, and this is bringing in uh, uh, the gentleman from the commission and uh, the chap from the food and water movement here, the importance of the ECI is that it, if you want to be successful in it, it, it obliges you to build that kind of coalition, because structurally that's how you get the signatures. So I think in that sense, whether that's what was intended when the ECI mechanism was designed or not, that's a, an interesting outcome of it in terms of participatory democracy. Um, the few instances we have seen of these kinds of coalitions, um, I guess the big one is ACTA since then, so the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, but that's slightly misleading in that the protest groups on the ground were really not very connected to the people campaigning about it at the EU level. So I'd say, uh, yeah, I think it's on the decrease, but it's something that we should try to increase if we take participatory democracy uh, seriously. Um, should you continue trying to do ECI, ECIs, even though they're quite frustrating, um, I think I've probably already given my personal answer to that is that yes because they make you build these alliances um, and again also coming in with the, the, the comments from the, uh, Mr Henley um, the citizens initiatives allow people to make their views heard on what they want them to be heard about whereas commission uh, consultation processes etc which are often very laudable ask the questions that the commission wants answers to so there's a, an element of agenda setting and giving some power back to citizens that I think is inherent in ECIs that's important to encourage. And reacting honestly, publicly and transparently to them is very important, I think, in that sense. Lately, I think, certainly since the departure of Margot Ballström, a lot of the Commission's uh, initiatives on transparency have been shifting transparency issues to the civil society sector. So 
the uh, register of, of people who consult with the Commission, with the Parliament, etc., ask for proof of internal democracy in civil society groups, which is seen as perhaps not so matched with information on transparency in terms of what the Commission then does with their opinions, with their voices. There is, I, I get the sense at least, the idea that some voices are worth more than others, particularly voices from business, and that we don't really find out what was done with the results of some public consultations. That's the sense I get from interviews I've conducted over quite a few years, in any sense. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I think Louise has said a lot of what I would have liked to say about it. I suppose I'd be speaking personally about the, the Commission and no offence to, to yourself, I, I think the Commission generally has too much powers because the power of initiation um, and the fact that they're appointed by, and I know we have had changes now and we've had the election of, of the Presidents of the Commission. At the time, I suppose, of the commissioner hearings, I'm a very new MEP. I'm elected for the first time in May, so I'll put my hands up in terms of I'm learning my way through the, in, the institutions. But my initial reaction to them was they were very much a box-ticking exercise that MEPs, like the amount of questions that were asked, the time you were given to ask the questions, uh, how, who was selected to ask the questions, and then you had no right of response. So in one of the situations where I asked a question, the, the commissioner uh, in waiting didn't answer it, um, repeated my question back to me, and, but there was no way you could re-engage and say, well, hang on a second, you actually didn't answer the question, and I know what I said, so you didn't need to read it back to me. Um, <laughs> so I was very frustrated as a new MEP going, this is not about democracy, the commission. Um, but what is interesting, even just since then, what I have seen, is certainly the more maybe learned MEPs very diligently took notes of what was said. As I said, in most of the hearings it was very little, but where there were indications given, I think now they may rue the day because it's almost like election promises that, as you said, four out of five of the commissioners signed up to the right to water, so they might be reminded on a very regular basis now from the Parliament whether it goes any further, but I even seen it with the GM and the, the Environment Committee wanted to put into the, the document about Juncker and his commitment on GM. Now, unfortunately, it was negotiated out. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. As I said, I'm a bit cynical as to the, the exercise that took place in the election of the, the commission. Um, I suppose with the ECI and whether it's a good tool or not, I think, as you said, it was a great tool to, to get that sort of social partnership. Um, my fear would be you will end up with ECI fatigue because it's very similar. What we see in civil society now is the petitions, the online petitions you get hit with could be anything from five to ten a day. And I think what you don't want is the ECI to be seen as that. And it's almost like you sign the ECI and then you can walk away and say you did your little bit for, for civil society. But if the, as I said, if the commission are genuine about participatory democracy and genuine about trying to uh, increase um, the citizens' attitude and promote how they, they, the citizens feel with the institutions and to restore that sort of trust, then I think this one particularly, the right to water, as I said, is there's real potential there to, you know, for them to step up to the plate and, and to take it seriously because, as I said, it was a, it was a big movement. Um, but also it's, it's a fundamental, this, this issue around water. So I, I would hand it over to the Commission in the sense that I think if they're genuine, there's, uh, there will be a lot of pressure, uh, certainly from me, <laughs> putting on the, to try and, and step up to the plate. Um, in terms of even where the Right to Water campaign goes, I think what's really important is that we capitalise on the mobilisation that took place because we know it, it, it was huge in different countries and as I said even in Ireland with water it's it's now where do we go from there and that's the conversation we're having in Ireland among those who are involved in the right to water campaign what now we still have the issue of the water charges and that but I think what has happened is the genie is out of the bottle and one that certainly I'm I, I suppose I'm a 
constant protester, as most people of the left. You'll see the same faces on most protests. What was really intriguing about the right to water protests in Ireland was the, the level of women particularly engaged in it that came out women and children, which was, you know, a real trend. But it was that people could sense the power they had. For the first time, as I can remember, as an activist in Ireland, there was a sense of political power that that your vote mattered, that your being out on the streets mattered. And I think with the ECI it's that as well. So it's the opportunity both from, as I said, putting it up to the Commission, but also us who are involved in the campaign, to take that opportunity now. People feel they have power. We need to, to try and, and to, to make that power uh, relevant. And as I said, back in Ireland, that's what we've been doing. So I think we need to continue with that broader base so not relying just on the institutions, but the, those who are involved in the relevant countries to go back and to keep the momentum going. Um, and also, as, uh, just your own point about the, um, the right to water and privatisation, because you're right, the, and I think that's another conversation we need to have. What is the best model of water service provide, provision? Um, and I think it was touched on maybe by yourself, Andres, about the governance of water provision I think is something key that we need to look at and how do you have civil participation in the governance of, of the water systems um, and I'll finish up just on the multinationals reaction um, I'll give you just the, the anecdote of, of what happened in Ireland we were we were certainly uh, demonized by uh, multinationals in the sense of though the man who got the contract for fitting the water meters also owns practically most of the media in Ireland and there was certainly a demonization campaign which was the initial reaction that you know there was a we were referred to as dissidents and sinister and uh, this trying to I suppose scare off because there was a lot of women out to scare them off scare and slowly break the movement down um, but what from the ECI point of view in the multinational I think what we have to be very careful of is what will be put forward or what will be lobbied from and particularly maybe from the more right-wing groups in the parliament when we come to writing the the parliament report is to just I suppose have our radar up for what amendments are coming in and what what the multinational reaction to that will be and I know we've, we've flagged around benchmarking and things like that and just the subtleties of what might try to be slipped in if we're not uh, tuned in and our radar isn't up. So I'll leave it there. Well, but we went on for too long, sorry. Uh, <laughs> then William, to conclude. Well, not to conclude, but as several have said, the struggle with, uh, continues. I think uh, one of the, just wants to stress again, uh, the importance of uh, the ECI right to water, and certainly for EPSU and the uh, EPSU affiliates, uh, is the continuation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the battle. Uh, and to keep water in, uh, in public hands uh, in most countries, to realize uh, the right to water uh, also at a European level. Uh, it is interesting that in, uh, think of Sarita, think of Podemos in Spain, uh, the, uh, the people who are also participating in the ECI, who are in these uh, political parties or in these political movements, are also committed to the human right uh, to water. Uh, and whereas our ECI combined many of these local struggles to try to achieve a European objective, uh, and there is a little bit of a, uh, how do you say, there is a little bit of a, a slowing down at European level, uh, because we're waiting for the report uh, to see uh, what's coming out. On the other hand, uh, at national level, at local level, uh, these discussions and struggles uh, continue, uh, certainly uh, in a number of the countries which have been mentioned, but others could be, uh, could be added. Uh, and in both uh, Southern Europe, but also uh, the Central West Europe and uh, Eastern European uh, countries. And think of Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, Hungary uh, as well. And so we are, in a sense, we are, I think the word is oscillating between the two levels, uh, European and national uh, <coughs> local level, and I think we will pick up again uh, when the report is there, and certainly when, as you were saying, there will be uh, political groups or uh, others who uh, seek to push through certain uh, not-so-positive uh, amendments. That brings me then to the transnational companies, a uh, question asked here. Uh, I would almost uh, straight away say, well, if you have to have balanced access, 
uh, look at the European water industry, uh, if you have one meeting with the private water sector, and they will probably approach you, I think you need five or six meters, meetings with the public water industry, uh, because they're so much larger uh, in Europe. That's balance. Uh, uh, or give them five minutes uh, and the others uh, an hour. Uh, that is balance, uh, I would say. The uh, private water industry uh, has uh, tried to reframe uh, the right to water. I think somebody mentioned that uh, earlier, uh, or you, I think you just mentioned it. They're not against the right to water, why should they? Uh, in terms of the European Citizen Initiative, what they have tried to do uh, is argue that the, right to water that the right to water should be included in the fundamental charter. Well, nobody is against that, of course. Uh, but what does that imply? <coughs> that implies treaty changes, conventions, and just one or two governments who have to say no. Uh, so it's a very clever way of trying to uh, derail uh, the, uh, the citizens' movement uh, behind the right uh, to water. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the Commission has the possibilities uh, to act, has the possibilities to do something, but we know that the Commission is heavily lobbied by the private water industry to do nothing. Uh, or to, or they steer in the internal cuisine uh, you have, uh, you refer to it in much more gentle terms, uh, the differences of opinion or the differences of view uh, within the Commission uh, services, uh, and they steer uh, these uh, discussions uh, up. One of the positive things from our perspective we're seeing in Europe is actually that the European Citizen Initiative but it was not only linked to the European Citizen Initiative, it's been a longer uh, struggle, is the remunicipalization of uh, uh, water, but also waste and other services, uh, where citizens want to see these services, which are so essential to them, uh, being brought back in public ownership, municipal ownership, uh, or forms of uh, public uh, ownerships. And the water industry, the private water industry, actually in Europe, is also reinventing its own business model uh, and uh, it's not by accident uh, that when we talk about the Juncker investment plan, a whole vast other subject, I'm not going to delve into it, one of the things it will promote is public-private water, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, again with all the risks that implies, uh, but that's also a new business model whereby the private sector uh, tries to run the system and we, as taxpayers, pay for it, yeah, but we also have to carry the risks uh, of uh, public-private water uh, partnerships. Uh, and it allows the private sector, and that actually happens also, uh, it's not uh, something I'm inventing, to walk away from contracts and who has to take it over, a public service, that is, uh, the, uh, that is the municipality, the state, so you pay. And you pay twice, first for the profits of a private sector company, and otherwise uh, to, uh, to cover the risks uh, of them. And so in the uh, investment plan of Juncker, there's a lot of push uh, for public-private partnerships with all the risks uh, involved uh, as well. And so that is certainly something we will be uh, focusing on uh, as well and trying to convince MEPs uh, of, uh, of the danger uh, there. Funding for the next phase as well, we still have a little bit of resources to continue. Uh, I will not delve into it uh, further. Would we be ready to do another one? It's always a good, uh, I think that's a good question uh, to ask. I would say yes and I would say no. I would say yes wholeheartedly because it has been very positive. It has brought the groups together uh, who were struggling at local, at national level in various countries. It has had tremendous positive effects uh, in various countries, build up the movements uh, in some countries, led to things as a law in Lithuania against privatization, led to the result of the referendum in Thessaloniki. So very positive uh, results uh, it has had. I would say no. Uh, if the, I hope following the positive uh, opinion of the Parliament, the European Commission doesn't do anything with the right to water. Uh, something on which you have the possibilities, where is the political will of political parties also to do something, and it doesn't happen, uh, then I don't think it's worthwhile for anybody uh, to do an ECI. Uh, it costs money, it costs effort, it costs energy, uh, and why do it if it doesn't have any 
effect despite the positive attitude uh, of many, including in the European uh, Parliament. If the European Commission, despite all of this, can in the end say, we don't care, we don't do it, or we bury it in bureaucratic uh, consultations. Uh, the drinking water, con uh, the consultation on the drinking water directive is one of the results of this. Something they had planned to do anyway. It's not as a reaction to the ECI. They had planned to do it anyway. And they cobbled it together with other uh, things they were planning anyway uh, in the response uh, to the ECI. What we want is a legislative initiative to implement the human right to water. It's not complicated. It's not very broad uh, what we want. Uh, we want to see that the Commission commits to not liberalizing the water sector. Not some fake <coughs> reference that uh, we will not, uh, uh, we are neutral on the issue. They commit to not coming forward with proposals that uh, liberalize, that you liberalize the water sector. Say, when you have the trade negotiations, we will not include drinking water, uh, water and sanitation services in the trade agreements. It's not very complicated to do, but still they don't. Uh, so, I think if the Commission doesn't react positively to what the uh, European Parliament uh, will say, then there we have to respect also the democratic balance. Uh, it might well be that uh, it's also abused uh, by some strange coalition uh, of parties uh, to do something else with it. But if the Parliament says the Commission should act on the human right to water and it still doesn't, I, which activist would, which organization wants to pour money into it, resources into an ECI, uh, and then I don't see that it helps with uh, uh, bridging the, uh, the, uh, the gap uh, in participatory democracy or the direct democracy, uh, and I think the instrument uh, would be that, uh, and certainly I don't think EPSA would want uh, to run uh, another legal, uh, EC, uh, official uh, ECI. Again, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't do collection of signatures or find other ways, uh, but an official ECI, uh, if nothing happens with it, uh, I mean, I don't think uh, any activist group uh, will pick it up. So, for the European Union, as in, uh, for the European institutions, uh, also following the ECOSOC, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee, positive opinion, hoping that the Parliament comes with a positive opinion, uh, we still have high hopes, uh, we still will uh, try to mobilize, certainly around the time uh, of the discussions uh, in the European uh, Parliament. Uh, so, if that has a positive result, I would say we do another one uh, if we have uh, consensus uh, on the objectives and if we have support, uh, we should do another one uh, quite fairly soon uh, as well. Yeah. So, a mixed, a mixed view.